guns, ammunition, soldiers, money. In 1776, the United States was desperately short on all counts, even as it was staring into the jaws of the world's mightiest superpower. George Washington had the unenviable job of molding farmers and merchants into a credible army. Benjamin Franklin set sail for Europe with an equally daunting challenge. Convince the King of France to openly side with America against the British. This was by no means an easy task. In the first place, the United States, even if the French recognized it as a legitimate country, was weak. There was absolutely no precedent for this sort of revolution to think that this new country could maintain its independence. Um, Franklin had no illusions about what was motivating the French. They were operating out of pure self-interest. They had an ancient rivalry with England. They had a, a piece of 1763 to seek their revenge for. They had no interest in American independence. And complicating things even more was the fact that the independence of the United States was premised on something that was absolutely anathema to the French crown, namely revolting against and overthrowing your king. In fact, the Declaration of Independence itself was banned in France. Selling an anti-royal uprising to King Louis XVI would test the limits of Ben Franklin's gamesmanship. Franklin knew he had little of substance to offer. His mere presence in France, however, became nothing less than a national holiday. The man who had tamed lightning was coming to Paris. He was the star of his day. The closest analogy I can make to Franklin's arrival in Paris in 1776 was the arrival of the Beatles in New York in 1964. And he is immediately the object of a sort of cult kind of worship. There are Franklin ashtrays and Franklin andirons, and there would be Franklin t-shirts if the idea had existed. There is Franklin wallpaper. It's an almost inescapable image. Franklin himself was amused by the frenzy. My portrait is a bestseller, he wrote to one of his children. Your father's face is now as well known as that of the moon. Ben would leverage his unprecedented fame to put the squeeze on Louis XVI. Louis XVI, the king of France, has to deal with growing discontent within his own country on the part of this rising bourgeoisie, the class that is going to take charge in the French Revolution. And Franklin takes pains to become as popular as possible with exactly this group. There's no question that his prestige is one of the biggest weapons in America's arsenal. So if King Louis then can't get along with Franklin, he risks not only alienating the Americans, but alienating this group that so loves Franklin. Franklin quickly learns to play politics French style. He becomes a master of that uniquely Parisian institution, the Salon. It is at these late night dinner parties that the movers and shakers of French politics could themselves be shaken and moved. So again, it's Franklin adapting pace of life is different. He realizes the approach to work is different. And he realizes that much is done on a very social platform. Franklin was a salon superstar, primarily because he was witty and supremely accomplished. But Ben also dressed for success, one of the great masquerades of his career. And he understood almost at once, almost intuitively, that the French would not be impressed with some pretender trying to dress as elegantly as they did. The way to their hearts was to be a simple backwoods Quaker. Franklin was never a Quaker. Franklin never lived anywhere near the backwoods in his entire life. But he began sending back to his buddies in Pennsylvania, I need shipments of coonskin caps and those ludicrous coonskin caps that he had never worn in his life. He begins wearing to every salon, to every public appearance. He played it to the hilt. The French were enthralled. And as Franklin's fame grew, so did the envy of certain other Americans. In particular, Franklin's ease with Parisian women, whom he sometimes referred to as his mistresses, 
stands in stark contrast to the tortured efforts of John Adams, another member of the American delegation. Franklin and Adams had two very different approaches to the French. You can even see it in the way they learned the French language. Franklin talks about how he learned to speak French by lounging on the pillows of his French mistresses, whereas Adams learned to speak French by memorizing a volume of French funeral orations. So they have a totally different style. He speaks of Franklin's charm as if it ought to be a controlled substance or something. And there's almost an eternal friction between the sort of classic over and classic underachiever, between the class nerd and the most popular guy, between Adams and Franklin. He goes to Paris and he discovers that Franklin is the lion of French society and Adams is a nothing. In fact, the people of Paris get him confused with Samuel Adams and they're always, well, they end up just calling him the other Adams. Even routine office work ended in fits of sputtering rage for the other Adams. John would be at work early and Ben would stroll in at noon after a late night at the salon. Adams thought it was ironic that the person who had spoken about early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. John Adams had grown up on Poor Richard's Almanac, and here was the author of Poor Richard's Almanac not following that kind of advice at all. But Franklin understood that he was actually getting more business done for the American mission at two o'clock in the morning in somebody's salon than Adams did at eight o'clock in the morning in the office. That's simply the way the world of Parisian politics worked. In Ben's view, John was a mixed blessing. He means well for his country, noted Franklin, and is always an honest man but in some things, absolutely out of his senses. The French find Adams even more annoying. The foreign minister refuses to deal with him. It is Franklin who patiently works the French government for more than a year. In February of 1778, after learning of a significant American victory at Saratoga, Louis XVI finally signs on the dotted line. Next to George Washington, Benjamin Franklin is probably the most indispensable person when it comes to winning the revolution. Now, what had been a trickle of covert arms becomes a potent battlefield alliance. A steady stream of weapons and soldiers arrive in America. France then provides 90% of the gunpowder we used in the revolution. The Marquis de Lafayette has almost as many French troops at Yorktown as George Washington has American troops. So that's what allows us to win the revolution militarily. Still, battlefield successes must be translated into diplomatic terms. After the decisive victory at Yorktown, Franklin and a team of American envoys would spend two years haggling with the British over details of a final peace treaty. In the end, the British realized that it wanted to have America as an ally. And Franklin is able to play off Britain against France. So they're both competing to have better alliances with America, because they realize that America is going to be the great trading and economic partner in the new century. And it ends up with Franklin uh, being able to make deals with both of them. <laughs> 